Does not mean that you have a mental illness. Being sad, angry, happy only gave us these emotions because he knew that we were go going to experience them. He knew that these emotions were going to be a part of our daily lives. We are going to regulate through these emotions many times during the day, if not during the day, during the week, if not during the week, during the month. It is, a, it, it, we're going to have, again, a good, men, you know, a good mental health that you can have the greatest day today and then wake up tomorrow on the wrong side of the bed and just be sad. And that's okay. When does it, when is it not okay? When, um, when do we need to seek help? When do we need to get other people involved? Um, and that is not if you're sad for one day, not if you're sad for two days. It's okay to be sad, but whenever that sadness becomes dysfunctional, whenever that anger becomes dysfunctional and affects your daily life, whenever, you know, if you can't get out of bed because you're just so sad, well, why are you sad? And you just, there are days whenever you just don't know why you're sad. You can't get out of bed for one day. That's fine. Can't get out of bed for two days. That's fine. It's turning into a week. It's turning into a month. You're not eating. You're not sleeping. What do you do? Why are you feeling this way? And you, and and that's whenever you need to start, you know, seeking the help, finding the help, whether it be in your family at first, whether it be your support system, whether it be getting professional help. But whenever those emotions start affecting your daily life, your day-to-day -day life, if you find yourself that you're not, you're not getting up out of bed, you're not eating, you're not sleeping, or you're sleeping too much, um, you're not doing things that you used to enjoy. If you used to enjoy going on walks, and now you find it very hard to go on a walk. If you used to, you know, like talking to your friends, hanging out, um, going to the movies, and those things just do not sound fun to you anymore, do not sound like something that you'd want to do, along with uh, the other things, like I said, you're, you're not able to get out of bed, you're not eating, you're not sleeping, that's whenever you need to find the help, and that's whenever a mental illness might come in. But, but again, you need, it, it's, we have to differentiate between the sadness and the depression. We need to differentiate between the sadness, between the worry and the anxiety. Um, are you worried about your test? It's a, it's a natural feat. It's a natural emotion. Being worried is a natural emotion. It's okay to be worried. It's okay to be anxious, but when does it, when does it become, when does it turn from just regular, you know, worrisome behavior, or regular, you know, anxiety over a test to, I have anxiety. I need to go to therapy. I need to get that medication. I need to seek professional help. So hopefully after this, after this talk, we'll be able to dif differentiate. You would be, you'll be able to notice it in yourself, in your family, in your friends. And then um, we could become more, more, you know, open to it in our community. Because unfortunately, whenever I was going back to look at, to try and find data um, on mental health in the Muslim community, we don't have any. It's very, very, very little. We don't have any because we don't talk about it. And so whenever, let's say, if I wanted to go into counseling to help my Muslim community, like I did, um, and I looked at the data to see how needed it was, and I didn't find any, what would my first thought be? Why would I go into this to help the Muslim community if they don't need it, if they don't have any mental problems, if they don't deal with stress and anxiety, if they don't deal with depression, if they don't deal with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, why would I go into this field if, I don't, if they don't need the help? Who, who else am I, am I get, going to help? As a Muslim woman, my goal was to go into this to help people. But if we're not talking about it, it truly looks like we are just, we're free of any mental illness. And that's not okay. Because one of the, one of the myths or one of the issues why it, Muslim Americans or just Muslims in general say they're not receiving mental health care is because they don't feel like there's anybody that understands them. Like a Muslim woman wants to go to a Muslim woman to talk about Muslim woman things. A Muslim man does not feel like a, just any, any, anybody would be able to help him, which is understandable. But we need to be able to talk about this so then the data could be there and we can know, okay, this is needed in our community. This is needed in our culture. This is needed around the world because people are suffering. Because, because again, the data is showing that we're not suffering. The data showing that we are free of mental illness, which is clearly not, not correct. And we all know that this is, this is thing, these are things that are being shoved under the rug. These are things that are being ignored. And the more you ignore it, again, the more you ignore the sadness and it becomes dysfunctional, the worse it gets. And data shows that the, 
So, so let's say you wake up tomorrow morning and by the shut, God forbid, you have the worst stomach pain. What do you do? You, it's a Sunday. Let's, let's pretend it's a Monday. You call your doctor, you go in for an emergency appointment. You go to the emergency room if the pain is too, is too bad, correct? Yes. You break your leg. What's the first thing you do? You go, you go to the doctor. From the onset of emotional pain, on average, the average person waits five to seven years before getting any help. And that's unacceptable. By that point, they are at the point of destruction. And a mental health professional should not be your last resort for help. You should not, they should be the very first person that you contact. This is, this is a problem with your brain. It could be a chemical imbalance. It could be a hormonal, hormonal imbalance. It could be something that's been passed down to you. It could be genetic. It could be something that's environmental that, you know, if you've gone through something and you need the help and you need to go to somebody licensed and you need to go to somebody good because this is somebody, th something for your brain, for your body. This is something that you need the best care for in order to live your life. Because if, if, if you're at the point of destruction, your life is pretty much paused. Your, your life is, you're not able to continue your life your everyday life. You're not able to go to work. You're not able to hold relationships. You're not able to take care of yourself. So what is, what are you doing at that point? Five to seven years. That is very, very sad. That is very sad. And I'm pretty sure in the Muslim community, that's just data based off of an average person in the United States. I'm pretty sure for Muslims, that number is a lot higher and they wait a lot longer if they even go. Um, alhamdulillah, I work at a, um, at a behavioral health hospital and I'm starting to see a lot more, um, a lot more Muslims come in, which, it, which as sad as it is to see somebody ill, it, it warms my heart to know that they are finally taking those steps, that their families are at the point of, we don't know what to do. We don't know why they're acting like this. We don't know why they're so sad. We don't know why this is happening. Please help us. And it's sad that it's taken this long but this is, this is something that needs to happen. Um, again, like I said, mental health is not mental illness. We all have mental health. Um, just because you have a bad mental health day does not mean that you have a mental illness. Um, with mental illnesses, um, there's a range of different disorders that affect your mood, your thinking, your behaviors, your daily life. Um, and these these mental illnesses have different symptoms. You can have two people who are diagnosed with a depressive disorder who have two completely different symptoms. Not e Each disorder does not look the same on each individual. And that's why it's so important. I'm going to list out some things that, you know, us as a community can look out in our, for in our families, in our friends, to see if you've seen any changes, um, what are the changes that you need to look out for? What are the things that you need to talk to them about if, the, if you do notice that, you know, if you are suspecting any mental illness, any bad mental health days, anything like that, what to look for. Um, those things, if you've noticed, again, like I said, um, a change in how they take care of themselves. If it's somebody that used to take care of themselves very, very well, they stopped showering, they are not clean and changing their clothes, they're in dirty clothes, they're not doing their laundry, um, not brushing their teeth, they just don't care about their um, physical appearance anymore, that's a big sign. Um, if they are not sleeping or sleeping too much, um, more than usual, if that you notice any dramatic appetite changes, if they just stop eating, if they're losing weight, if they're gaining a lot of weight, um, that's something to look for. Um, if you notice dramatic shifts in their moods, if one minute they're happy, the next minute out of nowhere, they're really, really angry. And this is not their normal personality. This is not the normal, you know, their, their norm. That's something to definitely look for. If you notice a drop in their functioning, if they're not able to do to function like they used to, if they're not able to do things that they used to be able to do that they were physically able to do, if that things that they were, you know, able to think and say and and things like that, if you notice a drop in that functioning, that's definitely a sign. Um, if they're telling you that they're seeing delusions, or if they're seeing people or hearing things that are not happening, that they're not seeing and they're, you know, delusions and hallucinations, that's a big sign. Um, and if somebody starts 
um, thinking and talking about suicide, if they say that they're feeling like a burden, if they say that they're hopeless and they just have no hope anymore and there's no point to living, if you notice somebody giving away their stuff, that's definitely a, a, a red flag for for suicide. And this is definitely some, suicide is definitely something we need to talk about in in our community because it's happening. It's happening, and the more we stay quiet about it, the worse it's going to get. We need to talk about suicide. We need to find the signs. We need to know um, what to look for, what to do if somebody is suicidal. Why are they suicidal? There's clearly, for somebody to want to take their life and no longer be on this earth, there is something underlying. It's not just, I'm having a bad day. I don't want to live anymore. It's, I'm having a bad life. And I would much rather die than go another day in this life. And we need to talk about it as a community, because if somebody in our community does die by suicide, that is on the community. We failed them. What did we miss? How did we miss it? Why are we not? Did, did they come to us to talk to us about it? And we just shoved it off and told them, no, they need to go, you know, repent and pray to Raqqa's and ask God for forgiveness. Is that what we did? Because in the end, they, I, I would say they're mentally ill. No, nobody in their right mind, nobody with a healthy mind would be able to look at themselves and say, I don't want to live anymore. So again, if they're talking about suicide, if, if they say that they're, they're feeling suicidal, if they're feeling hopeless with no purpose, um, if they say they feel like a burden, and if you ask them, are you feeling suicidal? Do you want to take your life? That does not increase the likelihood of suicide. So don't be afraid to tiptoe around that question. If you are feeling like somebody is might take away their life and they have the means and they have the intent, do not tiptoe around that question. That it does not increase the likelihood that they will die by suicide. If you know somebody that's been self-harming, if they've been cutting themselves, talk to them about it. Why are you self-harming? Why are you hurting yourself? What are you are is this, you know, is this a suicidal act? Are you wanting this to hurt you to the point that you die? Is this taking away the pain? If it's taking away pain, what is that pain? What can I do to help you take that pain away? Who can we talk to to help you take that pain away? Okay, that those are definitely things that, you know, need to be addressed and that we should look for. Um, if you find that somebody's unable to, and you know, take to cope with their daily stressors, if it's somebody that you know that was, you know, strong at one point and was able to cope you know, just fine. They were able to, to, you know, go about their life, deal with their daily stressors, but all of a sudden they're not able to. All of a sudden the smallest little thing ticks, drop, they, and after the, the smallest little struggle or the smallest little challenge, they fall into bed and can't get back up. They don't know how to move forward. That's a sign. If you feel like they've had an increase in worry and anxiety, that's something to look forward to, to look forward sorry, not forward to. Um, those are all things that we need to keep an eye out in our families first. Our main duty is our family because everybody is struggling. Something that you might not, just a small change, a slight change in somebody's behavior and your brother's behavior and your mom's behavior, your, your, your dad's behavior. A small change in behavior could mean they're, they're at their tipping point, could mean that they are at the, that, that they're hurting and they just don't know how to say it. That, you know, and a lot of us suffer in silence. A lot of, and especially these days, we are in a time, subhanAllah, with this pandemic, you know, it, I say to, to look for things in, in your families, to look for things in your friends. And subhanAllah, we are at a time whenever we can't, a lot of us are separated from our friends and family. We can't notice. So we need to, we need to ask about them. We need to keep in contact. I know it's hard. There are some days you don't want to talk to anybody. There are some days where, the thought of talking to anybody is the biggest struggle. It's a biggest stressor, but we need to keep in contact. We are a community. Our Muslim community, our Ummah is a community, whether in St. Louis, whether in the entire country, we are a, a, a we're living in an individualistic society, but we are together, we are one big community and we need to make sure that everybody is okay. We need to make sure first and foremost that we are okay. We need to ask ourselves, is there anything, you know, if, if, if we're really sad, is this just one bad day or can I get through this? Am I going to be able to get through this? Do I need the help um, to get through this? And if you do need help, reach out, do not be ashamed. There is nothing to be ashamed for if you need help. The help is out there. You just have to find it. You know, there are people out there that want to help you. People go into this field, like myself, 
to help because we know there are people struggling and most of the people that go in through this field have struggled themselves. So they don't, they, they go into this field because they want to be able to help other people not go through what they went through. We want to be able to make sure that, you know, whenever you do need the help, you don't have to look very far. Okay. So now it comes to Muslims and mental health. Again, it's, it's extinct in our community. We don't talk about it. Um, if somebody comes to you, you know, if you go to the masjid and you say that you're feeling this, this, and this, the first thing people say is low iman, which is absolutely not true. I've run into people who are pr pray their, you know, their five prayers every single day on time. And if they miss fajr, it's, it's literally, they, they can't forgive themselves for missing fajr. And some of the strongest people I know who struggle and it's okay to struggle because Allah tests us. He tests us through trials and tribulations. He tests us with challenges. And our brain is the most resilient thing, it, the most resilient part of our body, but it's also fragile. We need to make sure it's taken care of. Allah sends us these trials and tribulations to test us, but He also, but he's also sent down treatments. He's also sent down treatments for whenever we're not able to, you know, we may have overcome his challenges, but we struggle, our brains struggle. Our brains are struggling. You know, it may not be able to overcome it like we, like it used to back whenever we were younger, or like we would hope for it to to be to overcome. So we have to we have to get that help, and it's okay to struggle. Um, there is a beautiful story while I was um, doing my research for for today about um, a story with the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and one of the Sahaba. He walked in. Um, the Sahabi was um, Abu Umama. He walked into the masjid. It was not the time for prayer. And he saw Abu Umama sitting in the masjid. So he asked him, um, why are you sitting in the mosque while it's not time for prayer? Abu Umama replied, oh, a messenger of Allah, I am, I am consumed by anxiety and debts. So this man to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him that he's, he's suffering from anxiety. His, he has so many debts, he's overcome with anxiety and he does not know how to move forward. Was the Rasul Wasallam's response to, to repent? Did he say, A'udhu Billah, how dare you say such a thing? How, how dare your Iman be so low that you're sitting in the masjid and you tell me this? No, the Rasul Wasallam said, and every time I hear this dua, subhanAllah, it gives me shivers because it's the Rasul validated. He validated his feelings and he and he gave him this dua because he knows depression exists, because he knows anxiety exists, and he knows that his ummah is going to suffer. So he says, um, should I teach you the words to say by which Allah the Almighty will remove your anxiety and settle your debts? The, the hadith or the dua is, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-hammi wal hazan I'll translate. And he said, he told Abu Umama to say this dua every morning and every night to overcome his anxiety. Um, oh Allah, I, I seek refuge in you from anxiety and grief. I seek refuge in you from inability and laziness. I seek refuge in you from stinginess and cowardice and I seek refuge in you from the burden of debt and oppression of man. SubhanAllah, the Rasul, if, if, if this was in our day and time, if, if um, somebody was to go up to, some, to another person and say, I am suffering from anxiety, I am suffering from depression, I just don't know what to do. The Rasul, the Prophet, the one that we are to strive to be like, gave this man a solution to his problems. He gave him this dua to, because he knew that this was real. He And the, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said it himself. What are we going to say? Astaghfirullah, the Rasul had low iman because he was saying that because he, he would say this dua every morning and every night. Are we going to accuse the Prophet, the Prophet of low iman, Astaghfirullah? How dare we as an ummah turn people away how dare we accuse them of having no to, to low to no iman? Again, our iman fluctuates just like our moods do. We're not always going to be constantly at the top and we're not always going to be constantly at the bottom. But we are not to, we don't know what's in the hearts of other people. We don't know what other people are, 
are feeling. We don't know the 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 faith in the level of iman other people are 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 at. How dare we accuse anybody? And that's not our job to judge. If somebody comes to you and asks for help, our duty is to listen. And in that moment, whenever somebody is really struggling, whenever somebody is really low at, at that low point, whether they've you know they're having a bad mental health day or they're already struggling with a mental illness, the strength that takes for somebody to come to you and want to talk to you and to be vulnerable and tell you about all the things that they're struggling with, it takes a lot. One, they're isolating. They're isolating, they don't wanna see anybody. They don't wanna to talk to anybody. But for it to get so bad to where they want to come and they want to open up to you and for you to go and tell them that they have no iman and how dare they and they need to go repent, Allah. The world has already body slammed, them, body slammed them down to the ground. They're already down here and they're trying to raise their hand so you could help pick them up just a little bit. Help pick them up just a little bit so they can just have that, just have a person to listen to. Talking helps. That's what therapy is. You go and you talk just for somebody to listen to them and you go and you kick them back down. How dare we? How dare we as an ummah have such a mentality, have, be at such a stage. Islam is about empathy. Islam, your level of Iman is not about how much Quran you read. It's not about how, how many prayers you have. And it's not about your fasting because that's not, your, your fasting has nothing to do with me. It does nothing for me. Your prayers do nothing for me. I'm not going to judge you based on your prayers and I'm not gonna judge you based on your fasts. And I'm not gonna judge you about how much Quran you read. I'm going to judge you based on how you treat me and based how, on how you treat the next person. So if I come to you for help and you knock me back down, where's your iman? Islam is about empathy. If you don't know how to help them, the best thing to do is not tell them other people have it worse because that doesn't help anybody. Because we're already down here. In our minds, we're, we're, we've, had it, we've had it really bad and we understand other people have it bad. You know, those struggling know that other people have it bad, but that thinking about other people's issues is not going to solve theirs. Thinking about other people having it bad is not going to solve theirs because they're so engulfed in their own problems. They're so engulfed in their sadness. They're so engulfed in their anxiety. They're so engulfed in their mental illness that they cannot think of any, anybody else. They cannot, they don't, they can't. And so to tell them that other people have it easier is not helping. You may think it is, but it's not. What helps is to let them know, to, is to listen. Listen. You don't have to say anything. Don't say anything. Sometimes all anybody wants is to just sit, to, to sit and to talk to somebody. That's why it's so important to have a support system. And in this day and age with this pandemic, everybody's struggling because we cannot, we do not have that constant support system like we like we did. All we have right now is, is video conferencing, FaceTime, and telephones. That's all we have. We don't have that 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 face-to-face -face interaction. And that's why these days it's so important to check on people, to check on, to check on your loved ones, to check on your friends, even if they don't have a mental illness, even if you 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 think that they're strong and they're they're doing fine. The majority of people are not. We're locked up in our homes. It's going outside is illegal. We cannot see our loved ones. We cannot, we, we can't do our, the life that we knew has been uprooted. And we have this new normal that we have to deal with. And a protective factor for, for mental health is to have that support system. It's physical touch. It's a, it's a protective factor. And that, that got ripped out of us. That, it got ripped out of our hands physical touch. We, we literally cannot hug our loved ones. We cannot shake hands with our friends anymore. We cannot shake hands with our loved ones anymore. So now we have to be extra vigilant. We have to, the way it's literally now just through communication, just how it's, and it's not about nonverbals now. It's all about the verbal because your nonverbals also give, give a lot away. If you notice that somebody's nonverbals have changed, that's a big factor. Um, so a lot of myths, sorry, I feel like I'm rambling. Um, a lot of myths that Muslims have about mental health is that it's seen as being a punishment from God. Another myth 
is people will, if, you, if you're depressed or if you're anxious or if you have any other uh, mental illness, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, you're, it's believed that you're possessed by jinn. Um, it's seen as shameful and that you're being, that you're disconnected from Allah and you have weak iman. Um, in that it's more of a Western concept. Um, like, you know, he, it's, this is, this was just something that was created here in the West and, you know, Muslims are immune, which is not true. You go back home to wherever you're from, whether it's Syria, Palestine, Pakistan, um, India, Bangladesh, anywhere you go, they are suffering from, with traumas, from wars, poverty. Everybody can, everybody has, suffers from mental illness. It's just, we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. The only place talking about it as of right now is the West mainly. So that's why everybody thinks it's a, it's a Western concept. Um, are we not, you know, even if it was just a Western concept, we are living among people in the West. We are, you know, breathing the same air. We are on social media with them. We are working with, we are, you know, at places of work with them. We go to school with them. Our challenge, the challenges they, they exhibit are our challenges and we have it even worse because of Islamophobia, because of hate crimes, because of the, the climate that we are currently in with Islam and in the West, we are dealing with it a lot worse. That we're dealing with mental illness a lot worse, but again, we're hiding it. And whenever we should be talking about it, we should be coming together as a community to discuss these things. And something I found that was really interesting, believe it or not, the first psychiatric hospital in the world, the first psychiatric hospital in the world was built in Baghdad, Iraq, 70 years after the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, 80 years after Hijrah. We were the first ones, the Muslims were the first ones. It was built by Muslims. We were the first ones to build a psychiatric hospital. This way before Freud even came in the picture, way before any other psychiatrist came in the picture. We built it. Where is the disconnect? Why is it now such a shame to discuss these things? Why are we seen as being sinful for being depressed? And, and the thing is with us as well, and this is something in the West too. One thing you learn about um, when going through grad school for counseling or for any mental health um, field is person first language. You learn that the individual is not to be labeled by their illness. They are not to be um, labeled by their disorder. So whenever we see somebody now that has, that's diagnosed with bipolar disorder, um, we should not, they should not be called, we do not say they are bipolar. We say John was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Sarah was diagnosed with depression. Um, they are not their disorder person first language, they are themselves. Just like if somebody has cancer, we do not say they are cancer. We do not say they are bipolar. We do not say they are broken foot, right? They are themselves. John is himself, Sarah is herself. I can all use Muslim names. Muhammad is himself. Dima is herself, but she just has this disorder. And if you have this disorder, it doesn't necessarily mean you are going to have you're going to live every single day in that episode. You can have a mental disorder and have good mental health days. As you know, you can have a mental illness and have a really good mental health day until you have an episode. It doesn't, ha you don't have episodes every day. If you keep up with your therapy, if you keep up with your medicine, if you keep up with, if you keep an eye and keep, take care of yourself, you won't have an episode. Just like if you have any, you know, any stomach issues, any, I'm, I'm not a medical person, but um, any other issues within your body, but you keep taking care of it and you take care, you, you, you keep up with your treatments and you keep up with everything that you need to keep up with, episodes will be limited, it will be, will be limited. Um, and then, it, it, and that is something that really helps just to keep uh, the medicine and, and the therapy um, will help lessen the episodes. And whenever you feel an episode coming on, um, therapists can help you with coping mechanisms, with coping skills. It, what do you feel like whenever you feel an episode happening? What are some things that we can do to stop this episode from happening? What are some things we can do to make this episode not as bad as the first one or the second one or the third one? Um, let me see. 
And another thing with talking about our emotions, um, one group in our Muslim community that is very um, disadvantaged are the men, um, regardless of regardless of age, um, generation. We our, our men grow up. What, and, and this is everywhere, but mainly in the Muslim community, you're not a, you're not allowed to have emotions. You're not allowed to speak of your emotions. You have to be the strong macho man. Um, you have to be able to take and overcome any challenges that you have that come your way. And that is not true. Um, you are, we are supposed, we, we should be checking in with the men as well. We should not just assume that all men are okay, especially I'm, I'm, I'm a millennial. Our older generations, our fathers came here. They had nothing. They had a dollar and a dream. And they started from nothing, but they were on survival mode. They didn't talk about feelings. They didn't talk about emotions, which is why this is a new concept. But we need to, but the way we see it now, their trauma, we just associate with them as their per personality. But if we look deep, if they were to go to therapy and unpack everything and, and, and unpack every little detail of their, their story and things that they went through, we, could, we would be able to find the trauma. And that trauma gets passed down into to their kids, to their wives, from their wives, to their kids, to their grandkids. That's generational trauma. And so if we can get our fathers, if we can get our grandparents to acknowledge that there may be something there that you know, just to talk to somebody, just to talk to somebody because it could help. We would be able to break those generational traumas. And it's it's understandable. They came here on survival mode. No time to talk, no time to think about my emotions. I have a dollar and a dream, and I have to make sure that I have a meal on my on on my my wife's table tonight because my wife and my kids have to eat. What happens tomorrow? We'll figure out once the day comes. They didn't have long-term goals. They lived their days day by day and had woke up with, I have to survive today. That is it, it that builds trauma. They don't talk about it. They don't realize it because that was not talked about back whenever they were starting their lives. But now we are in a we're we're in a place now where mental health and traumas and the stigma is coming around. And we're luckily a, we're in a culture where we're able to speak about it. We're able to talk to our parents about it. And it's hard. It's hard coming from somebody who went to school to grad school for this. I still have discussions and debates with my parents. I still have discussions and debates with my dad. I still have the, you need to read more, more Quran if you're, if you're depressed um, talk, which is a, spirit, spirituality and religion is a huge part of good mental health. Don't get me wrong. It, I'm, whenever, I get to, whenever I get to that part, it's a huge part of it, but it's not going to fix anything. And us throwing a Quran at somebody who's mentally unstable why don't we throw a Quran at somebody who has cancer? Why don't we throw a Quran at somebody's leg after they've after they've broken their leg and just tell them to tough, to suck it up and it's probably because they missed Thuhr? Why don't we do that? Your mental health should be as important, important if not as physical health, as your physical health. This was sent down as an amana from God, sallallahu, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was set down as an amana. We need to take care of it. It is our duty to take care of his amana, whether it be our physical health or our mental health. And that's and that's what we need to start. Th these are the conversations we need to start having with our families. These are the conversations we need to start having with our parents. And it's hard. It's hard. Again, it's, I'm still having this conversation. This is my career. It's hard to have these conversations because they're coming from a place where it doesn't, where it didn't exist. It still doesn't exist. If you talk to people back home in your in in their countries, it does not exist. Whenever I went through, you know, my counseling, um, grad school, and I had to talk to pe my my aunts and uncles back home, I had to figure out what the word is. I had to put words together for in in Arabic in order for it to come out in as counseling for them to understand what counseling was. That it doesn't exist, but our first step is to work within our families. Our first step is to talk to our parents. It's going to be hard, but if, if there are any parents on here listening, it's, it's important, it's vital, because if we do not have these conversations, we are going to lose ourselves. We're going to lose our community. 
Because whenever we don't have these conversations in our homes, that's what pushes people to suicide. That's what pushes people for, to, to use substances. Because the first step is they will come to you. They will try. And what is our go-to? You have low iman. You need to make sure that your duhur is prayed on time. You need to make sure your asad is prayed on time. It's because you didn't wake up for fajr today. This is why you're feeling sad. We don't talk about that in this household. So what are these, what, what, is, what are our youth doing? What is, are these generations doing? They're going to substances. Because what do substances do? They make you forget for just a little bit. For just a little bit of time. And so you have just a little bit, right? You use just a little bit and you have just a little bit. And then you forget. And then you start taking more because it makes you forget and you like the way it, you feel whenever you forget, right? And then you start taking more and then all of a sudden you're addicted. And addiction is hard. Addiction is not, I'm going to stop. I, I could stop drinking wherever. Can you put your phone down whenever? This is an addiction as well. Social media, our phones, our laptops. It's an addiction. Try and, try and stay off your phone for one whole day. Not even a whole day. Try and stay off your phone for half a day. Are you able to do it? That's the same way as telling an addict to stop smoking and same way to tell an addict to stop drinking. It's the same way you're telling an addict to stop using the substances. And why did they turn to those, those substances? It's because us as a community, we failed them because we didn't listen to them. Because whenever they came to us, we turned them away because we don't have the help. We, and we, we have the help, we don't know about it because we're not educated about it. Because, because we're not educated about where to go get the help. The help is there. There are people out there, whether Muslim or not, they want to help you. People go to school for this. People, people's lives are, are rely on this. They want to help you. But we as a community need to, we need to strive to learn. We need to strive to want to have these conversations. And again, it starts in the home. If your kid comes to you with these, you know, wanting to talk about this, if your kid comes to you wanting to explore conversate or have conversations about gay and lesbian relationships, we need to have these conversations because it's happening in our community. If you say astaghfirullah and shoo them off, they're gonna go, the internet is at their fingertips. They have their phones, they have their laptops, they have their friends, they have their Western friends. They can find anything anywhere. They can meet up with people anywhere. Would you rather them learn these concepts and learn about this stuff from your own home in the comfort of your own home? Or do you want them to go find it from strangers? Do you want them to go deal with these struggles that they may be having related to gay lesbian relationships, to substance abuse, with suicide? Do you want them to go find that out from strangers, non-licensed strangers? Or would you like them to have them to have those conversations in your home? If you don't know what to say, you find somebody who knows what to say. Again, the help is there. We just have to be ready to acknowledge it. We have to be ready to acknowledge that this issue is happening. People, we have our youth who are dying from substance use, but we cover it up. We don't say it's substance abuse. We cover it up with some other, with some other things because it brings shame. Like I said earlier, the shame is on us because we did not notice, because we turned a blind eye. And so we, lo we lose one person in the community. We lose the next person in the community. We lose the third person. The third person becomes the hundredth. How many more people are we gonna lose? How many more eyes are we gonna turn? Until this becomes an issue that we need to, that we need to talk about. And whenever you have these issues, the Imam is a great person to, you know, the, the Imam wants to help you. The Imam is, there as a community support, but the imam is not a licensed professional. If you're having issues with substance abuse, if you're having issues with suicide, if you're having issues with mental health issues, the imam is great, but he's not licensed. If you're having marital issues, the imam is great, but he's not a marriage family therapist. If you're, if for, go to a licensed professional. They exist. If you can't find a Muslim one, keep going to, to one that's not Muslim until you find the right one. Until you find somebody that can, that can understand you, that can work with you. They exist. Counselors are supposed to be culturally competent. If they don't know, they will ask. 
They, if, they may not ask you, but they will search the internet. They will research. They will ask people that they know that are Muslim. I work with counselors who come to me and say, I have a client who is so-and-so, a client who is Muslim. They don't tell me details because of confidentiality, but what can I do with, how can I work with them? They want to learn. They want to help us. They want to help us. We just have to be willing to go out and say, okay, I need the help. And again, it's hard. It's hard to be vulnerable, especially if you've been knocked down from people in your own life who don't want to listen to you. It's hard. It's hard to open up to a stranger and bring out all your traumas and bring out all the hard, th the, the challenges that you've been, into, in, been, been through in life. It's hard. And I wouldn't say that if I hadn't gone through it. I've been in that position. And again, my, my, thing, my perspective is that people learn through other people's stories. I could sit here and I could preach to you that mental health is important. I can sit here and I can preach to you that, men, that going and seeing a therapist is important and will help. But unless I've been through it, that means nothing. I've been through it. We've all had challenges. I hit rock bottom to the point where I was like, okay, I cannot help myself anymore. I used to see myself as a strong, resilient person and I hit rock bottom and people would look at me and say, my support system, the people that I thought were my support system, people that I would go to and, and would want to help me and I would cry and they would say, Dima, you are strong, you do not cry. Dima, you are not to let this knock you down. So what did I do? I hit rock bottom because I was not allowed to cry anymore. I, my support system, I couldn't talk to anymore. What do I do? Luckily, from my mental health past and from my work in mental health, I was able to pick myself back up and say, I'm going to find a therapist. It, he was not a Muslim therapist, but he helped me. He helped me because I wanted the help. He helped me because I wanted to be in his office every week for 10 months. I wanted to be there because I wanted to be better because I knew I had a problem and the people around me were not able to help me. So I knew I had to help myself and I couldn't help myself on my own. I needed this, the stepping stool. A therapist is a stepping stool. A therapist, you don't go to a therapist to, so they can give you advice. That's not what therapists do. We don't give advice. They go to help you, to help guide you through your life, through your life's challenges. You have this, you have this problem. What is your goal? How are we going to reach your goal? And you go and you talk. You talk, you cry, you laugh, you share new things. Your therapist becomes your new best friend. My therapist, without, without him knowing, was my best friend. I would look forward to our meetings every week because he made me feel safe. He made me feel like I was supposed to be there. He made me feel like I was strong. Again, like my support system would tell me, Dima, you're strong, you're not supposed to be crying but I'm going through this challenging time in my life. What am I supposed to do? I'm sad. What do people do when they're sad? But my sadness was destroying my life. It was dysfunctional. I was not getting out of bed. I was not eating. I was down to 80 pounds, skin and bone. Not eating, not talking to my friends, not leaving the house. It was my favorite season, fall, love to go hike, love to go on walks, was not doing any of that. I was just laying in bed, rotting away. But I was told that I was not allowed to cry because I was strong. So that's whenever you go and you see a therapist. That's whenever you go and you see a psychiatrist if, you need, if, it, if it comes to the point whenever you need medication. And it's okay to not be okay. There's nothing shameful about it. There's nothing shameful about not being okay. Just like it, there's nothing shameful about having cancer. And there's nothing shameful about breaking your arm or leg. It's normal because Allah sends us these trials. He sends us challenges and we can overcome them. But we have, if it's a traumatic challenge, we have, there, there are side effects down the road. There's things that we still have to deal with because again, our brain is resilient, but it's also fragile. We have to take care of it. There are some ways, um, how are we doing on time? Okay, um, that being said, there are a lot of different protective factors that you can take to take care of your mental health. So we just talked about all the negative sides of it, right? We just talked about all the negative sides. For mental wellness, how do we take, how do we make sure, how do we try? I don't wanna say make sure,
But how do we try to not get to the point of mental uh, uh, mental illness? How do we how do we try to not get to that point? Just like just like, like a physical just like for phys physical health, good physical health, eat well, have a healthy diet, exercise. Exercise is probably your best antidepressant. If you don't want to go with medication, sometimes it could actually be better than medication. Exercise, exercise out in nature, go to the gym, move around. Exercise is your greatest antidepressant. And it's hard in the winter. We're saying this now and it's, it's freezing outside, but keep active, keep active. And again, it's hard whenever you're in that situation, when you don't want to get up and move, whenever you don't want to get out of bed, whenever you don't want to eat healthy, have that support system, the ones that you can count on, even if it's just one person. And we may think that we have a great support system with our, with our, you know, thousands of followers on Instagram and thousands of, of friends on Facebook, but ask yourself this, how many of those people on Instagram and how many of those people on Facebook can you count on? Can, whenever, whenever you're feeling down, will they notice? How many of those people will they know, will notice? Two, maybe three, four is pushing it, right? Those, th that's not your support system. Those people are there because they just wanna watch your life. Those people are there because they just wanna like your picture. Those people are there because they want the likes, because they want to have the more followers. Those people are, they, they don't, they can't tell. They can't tell unless you're going, unless you're physically showing them that you're not okay. And we're not gonna show that on social media, right? Because everybody on social media is happy. Because whenever you're down and depressed and you get on social media, what's the first thing you see? You see the happy couple with their child. You see the happy, you see the, the, the skilled selfie taker who looks so happy. Again, we don't know what, what, what they're going through. We don't know what people are going through. But to us, whenever we're down and not doing well, that person's life is perfect. Everybody's life is perfect but mine. I'm struggling, but everybody's life is perfect. And that makes it even worse. Social media is makes our depression and anxiety and mental health even worse because we want to be the next best person. We want to be as happy as everybody else, but nobody's showing you their struggles. If we if people were to see our their if people were to show us their struggles on social media, we would thank God for the challenges that He sent us because it would not compare to what everybody else is going through. But we don't know that. No. We don't know that. So social media has really definitely played a part in our in our in our mental health and our mental wellness. So to go back to the list, exercise, eat healthy, have a well-balanced diet, um, especially with fatty acids, very good for the brain. Sleep. Sleep. Like I said before, and one of the ways to see if somebody is um, struggling with 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 mental health. If they have, you know, if they're sleeping too much or not enough, sleep does wonders. Whenever you're tired, rest. And, and it's, it's, in, it's in Islam. When you're tired, rest. Don't stay up all night and pray qiyam if you're tired and you need the sleep. At the hospital, whenever people come in, whenever people come into the hospital and we ask them, and, and you know, they're having these suicidal thoughts and they're having these ideations and, or they're having these delusions and these episodes, from their mental illness and we ask them how many hours of sleep they've gotten it, it'll be a friday and they'll tell me four for the entire week but then they sleep that night they sleep they they'll take medication and they'll sleep that full night and they wake up a completely different person sleep is vital in your mental health don't stay up playing your ps5 don't stay up on netflix don't stay up because you feel like you need to you know cleam no you need to sleep for your well-being um, you have to have a healthy family and home life. Again, have hard conversations with your kids. Have, have healthy relationships with your kids. Let this, let the, let your home be someplace that your family looks forward to coming to. Don't let it be a toxic place. Don't let it be a place where your, you know, your family doesn't want to come out of their rooms. We need to have a healthy home life. We all need to feel like we're safe at home, especially in times like this, because we have nowhere else to go, literally. We cannot go anywhere else. We need to have a healthy home life, have a healthy, um, have healthy social connections and community, again, outside of social media. 
whether that be through the masjid, whether, and it doesn't have to be a, a Muslim community, which, but a Muslim community is, is important because so we can feel accepted because that's what we all want. We want, all want to feel accepted, but it doesn't have to be a Muslim community. Your job, you know, having a good community at work, having good coworkers, enjoy, you know, you're at work, what, 40 hours a week, 40 plus hours a week. You want to like the people that you work for, work with, right? So have a healthy work, work environment, health, uh, uh, healthy social connections at work, um, at school, if you're still in school, he a healthy friend community. Having that is vital because again, your family might not be the first people that you're going to go to if you're struggling, your support system will be, your friends will be those one or two friends that you can count on to be vulnerable with. That is vital, that is necessary. Having connections with nature, going out into Allah's creation. It's so, it's the, the, the feeling that you have whenever you go out and you take a breath of fresh air, even in the cold. I hate the cold. I went out this morning, the second I walked outside, I felt like a completely new person. It's so important to be out in nature, to take a walk, to take a hike, to be active, to exercise outside, helps your mental well-being so much and your mental health. Be creative. If, if you like art, whenever you, you feel signs of depression, whenever you feel stressed, whenever you feel um, anxious, color, draw. If you feel like, if, if you're a writer, write. Be creative, take that to the next level. I know in our cultures, you know, it's it's either being a doctor, a lawyer, or it's out the door. But there's so many other avenues that we can use, that we can take in our in our community in order to, to be our best selves. Even if you are on one of those paths, whenever you're feeling stressed, um, even as adults, they have these really cool adult coloring books these days that you can use and it reduces stress. Being creative, and whether it be through art or writing or whatever it is, photography, whatever it is, has been known to, to reduce levels of stress, reduce levels of anxiety. Um, and again, and, and, and the most important one, every one of us needs to feel like we have purpose, like we have a, a meaning and a reason to be here. And that is through, for us, Islam. Again, your depression is not going to be solved by your prayer, unless Allah, of course, subhanahu wa ta'ala sends, sends it down for you. But we need to have that purpose. Sorry, one moment. We need to have that purpose. And we are told that our purpose here is what? Is to, is to obey Allah. It's to serve Allah. Our end goal is what? It's Jannah. So as long as we have that purpose and we work towards that, and then along with that also have other purposes. You know, my, my goal in life, in life, before I make it to Jannah, inshallah, is to, is to go to grad school. My goal in life is to become a millionaire. Okay, that's fine. We have that purpose. We're working towards it. We work towards it. We make dua that Allah, that Allah eases it for us. But whenever you make that dua for either, you know, for, for Jannah or whenever you make dua for Allah to take away your pain, whenever you make dua for Allah to protect you from depression and anxiety, Allah's still holds you accountable for your, all your other responsibilities. Whenever you make dua for Allah to send you a to make you a millionaire, don't sit back and wait for Allah to 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 send you the, the the millions and just say I'm being patient because Allah told me to be patient. No, Allah still holds you accountable. Allah still holds you accountable to go to work. Allah still holds you accountable to to take care of your home, to take care of your family, to to do your day to keep up with your daily responsibilities because then you know, if you make dua and Allah is going to answer your dua for a million dollars, he may answer it by increase, by giving you a raise at work. He may answer it by giving you a new job. He may answer it in, in different ways, but sitting back and being idle, just like with depression. If, if you know, you say this dua that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to say every morning and every night and just sit back and say, Allah is going to protect me from depression and not do anything about it. We just said, if you sit back and don't see anybody and don't have that human connection and don't go out and do your daily thing, you're going to fall into mental illness. You're going to have depression. Allah's still holding you accountable to get up. Allah's still holding you accountable to move. Yes, be patient. Be patient for those millions. Be patient for, um, for healthy mental health, but also move towards it.
but also help. And Allah said, in, in, in the, in the um, aspect of mental health, any, you know, mental health and physical health, Allah says, I sent down the disease and the cure. And that hadith is, مَا أَنزَ اللَّهِ دَاءً إِلَّا أَنزَلْ 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 لَوْ الشِّفَاءِ Allah sent down the, 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 the disease and sent down the treatment. So he's telling us he sent down this disease, but he also sent us its treat, the, the treatment. Whether that treatment, whenever you feel like a depressive episode is coming on, if you feel that treatment, is, if, you, if your treatment is to go out and walk into nature, if your treatment is to, to schedule an appointment with your therapist, if that treatment is to take your medication, whatever that treatment is, Allah sent it down to us. He sent us this disease. Who are we to deny that it exists? Who are we to deny that this person has low iman, that this person is, 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 is crazy, crazy as we like to say, and, and has jinn inside them? We are willing to accept that our family member, our friend, somebody in the community has jinn inside them and do ruqya, but we are not willing to accept that they may have a hormonal imbalance we are not willing to accept that they have a chemical imbalance. We're not willing to accept that. And our, the, first, the first step to healing, the first step to anything is acceptance. And we need to work as a community to accept this. Um, again, for good mental health, resilience, ability to cope with any stressors. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, ability to accept with any stress and and being able to bounce back if you notice yourself falling off of that um figure out what's happening how you what kind of help you need and how you can bounce back your social well-being your social well-being your healthy relationships um and we need to again know the difference between healthy relationships and toxic relationships is this relationship bringing me good and positive feelings in my life is this relationship bringing me just negativity? And how am I feeling after every relationship? That is something, those are conversations that we need to have with ourselves and we need to acknowledge. Self-care for your mind. Um, what are your coping me mechanisms? What are your strategies to deal with your, your stressors? What are your strategies, strategies, strategies to deal whenever you're anxious, whenever you're sad? What are those? That's your self-care. Self-care isn't always pizza in a movie. Self-care is us acknowledging we have this issue. How are we going to deal with it? It's not, it's not always flowers and butterflies. We have to have those hard, hard, hard conversations with ourselves. Don't self-medicate with drugs and alcohol. We need to work on that as a community to be open. Somebody, and again, if you notice any of this with any of these issues with anybody in your family, a support system, anything, go ask. Just yesterday, I was listening to a the Jum'ah khutbah for um, Imam Omar Sulaiman. Um, don't, don't wait for somebody to come and ask you for help because people will not, especially if it's somebody that's not used to asking for help. And then this pandemic came along. They don't have food. People are out of jobs. They don't have money but their dignity will, is not allowing them to come and ask you for help, we go ask. If it's people that we used to see at the masjid or people we used to bump into whenever we used to be able to go out and we don't see them anymore, check in, check in. You may just be the answer to their prayer. They may be asked, they may, you, you never know whose prayer you're, you're going to answer. Whenever you go and you just, what, what's it hurting us? Hey, are you okay? Hey, how are you feeling? And don't be sufficient, and alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm okay is not sufficient. How are you feeling? Because none of us are okay. None of us are okay. None of us are okay in staying at home, you know, every day, seven days a week. None of us are, are okay with not having a support system. None of us are okay with, with the struggles that we're going through in the entire world. So it's not going to hurt us to check in on, it, on other people. Um, be mindful of yourself. Be bring awareness to to the present. You know, whatever happened in the past, I'm not going to worry about the future. I'm not going to worry about the past. What am I feeling right now? What is it I'm going through right now? Be mindful. Gratitude. The last point. Allah tells us in the Quran, if you are grateful, I will give you more. Being gracious, uh, being grateful, in has proven has proven. Um, 
to show that it helps it, it, it helps your mental health. Sorry. It helps your mental health in so many different ways. Having a gratitude journal. I'm not a person that, that, that likes to journal. I don't like writing anything down, but it helped wonders whenever I would wake up every morning, just write three things that I'm grateful for just to kind of, just to take me out of that negative headspace, even for, even if it's just for two minutes, even if it's for two minutes of the start of my day, just what am I grateful for? Even if it's, I'm grateful for my bed, I'm grateful for my mom and I'm grateful for my phone just to show I have three things that I am happy for. Now, at the end of the day, do the same thing. The amount, it takes you out of that negative headspace. It reduces your stress. It puts you in a better bubble. You get, you start your day on a good note and you end your day on a good note, regardless of what happened, you know, throughout the day. And Ola tells you, be grateful and he'll give you more. All you have to do is just say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah for this. Alhamdulillah, we're going through a pandemic. I still have my house. Alhamdulillah, I may not have my job anymore, but my family is healthy. Alhamdulillah, I'm able to feed my family today and tomorrow and the next day. Alhamdulillah for the Muslim community who is now going to go home and talk to their families about mental health and check in with their loved ones. Alhamdulillah. And I'm very, very grateful that you guys allowed me um, this time to um, talk to you guys about such a pressing issue and one that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I wanted to, I know that we're running short on time. Sorry, I went over. Um, I wanted to share my screen real quick. I have some resources for you guys. Um, mental health resources. If you need any help, um, any immediate help or anything like that. Um, if you guys want to take pictures of the resources, we can do that. Uh, let me see. I've never done this kind of nervous. Let me see if this works. Can you guys see my screen? Yes or no? Not yet. No, okay. Um, Nothing yet? No, okay. I don't know. I What I might do, uh, Sister Imani, is send you the PowerPoint. And if you could um, just, oh wait, sorry. Okay, it's not working. Um, what uh, Ayan, you might need to share. Uh, sharing capabilities. Oh, am I not a co-host? Yeah. Um, uh, I think I turned it on because Imani was able to share that picture at the beginning of the meeting. Yeah, it should be on. But that's all right. If you can't figure yeah, it out, no we'll worries. definitely be able to email it out, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll get that email to you, inshallah. Um, I just had some resources, some Muslim, um, Muslim mental health professional for mental, Muslim mental health professionals for some substance abuse and addiction, um, as well as sliding scale services. Um, if you don't have insurance or are not, you know, financially able to pay for accounts, um, pay full price for therapy, um, that should help for sliding scale. I just want to say thank you so much, Sister Dima. This was really informational and your passion about the subject really shines through. I'm really um, personally very excited to see someone um, so passionate about mental health in our community. Jazakallah khayan so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Of course. And before we turn to Q&A, um, we have Dr. Halal Ramadin from the Masjid, uh, Masjid um, Shura who would like to give a couple comments. So, first of all, Thank you very much. It was a wonderful to listen to you and I appreciate your input and your passion. And I think uh, it's very pleasant to see that you have so much of knowledge and in the community. And I think we need Imani, we need to utilize her. And I would encourage, yes, please. Uh, because I think it's, a, to, to my passion, let me tell you that I think it's like in the form of a, endemic that we are dealing with is the drug and depression. And we just have to be open about it, that we need to face it up front. We can't just hide it or push it under the rug and we everything will be fine. So I think 
but i encourage everyone to have the discussion among yourself and if and try to come with suggestion anything you want we will we will try to do everything which we can do for our youth and i have talked to sheikh hamza and mufti asif and we will be rolling out series of lecture in terms of islamic religious perspective of it and i also want to pull your opinion how you want to intervene in these things because i know istabu i don't want to come to you because everyone will say oh yeah you know he he has some psych issue and he went there so i want to something yeah this is i you know the nature of it uh so i think we we need to work on that also and and then we can come with a strategy that we can help each other absolutely and 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 again i went into this um because i wanted to help people in our community and i know i know the need that we need that you know how how needed it is in our community so please utilize me in any way um i'm more than happy to help in any way um so that made me very happy to hear i'm glad that you guys are you know rolling something out with this um because again i feel like coming from imams because we do our first instinct is to go to an in imam for anything um if it comes from somebody directly in the masjid our families may be more um inclined to hear if a if an imam or somebody from the masjid is to say okay you might need professional you know professional help for a from a therapist for my psychiatrist that may be more accepted than coming from me who nobody knows um so so having that at the masjid i feel like is is very needed and it would be very very helpful thank you thank you very much thank you imani for arranging it wonderful of course a uh, um great congratulations and thank you to the mistel um boards for putting to this together um so that brings us to our first question which is kind of related to what um dr kamaldin just brought up um someone asked in your opinion what assistance do you think that masajids and islamic schools can provide to address this pressing issue do you have any guidelines for masajids which we can use to create a strong support system for muslims in the community who are suffering and for their families again like i just said um we it needs to be talked about in the masajid um there need to be workshops there need to be there needs to be more open communication um because we are going to the imams and they're doing a wonderful job but again they have a lot on their plates and they're not licensed professionals so if the if the imams even started just through their juma khutbah to talk about mental health and how that fits in with islam and i know they don't have that much time especially now with their with their restrictions but if they were to just bring it up and get it kind of working in our in our communities minds and then go from you know if if the world ever opens up again have workshops if not have webinars have you know have the masajid and mental health facilities um link up and do do some sort of informative do some do a mental health screening day at the masjid do talks from mental health professionals um just so it can become more normal in our in our community because at, as of right now i mean other than this no one's other no one's doing anything no one's talking about it every year around the time of ramadan i always say this and and it's great to have ramadan reminders and every year around ramadan we have the same khutbah we have the same reminders which is great because we need it um but we're not having talks we're not having the hard talks we're not having the talks about mental health we're not having the talks on substance abuse we're not ha having the talks that our kids are out there um and are afraid to tell us that they're they're identifying as gay that they're identifying as lesbian what are we going to do about it we're not talking about the the rising divorce rates among our muslim brothers and sisters and what's the issue and how are we going to fix it these are things that need to be talked about in our masajid to become the norm because if it's not talked about in the masjid it's not the norm because whatever happens at the masjid our our fathers our mothers our brothers our sisters bring home to the house and then it can be talked about but until then it's going to be hidden so talk about it in your khutbas have web, have webinars have um workshops link up with mental health professionals link up with counselors um and and, and start that way make it normal make it normal to not be okay Thank you for the answer. So another question we have is what advice would you give to people struggling to find motivation to continue with their daily obligations as as Muslims? Um for that I would say start slow. Don't if you're having if you're if you're struggling, 
Set daily goals for yourself. If you're struggling with your five daily prayers and you're currently not praying any, and you feel like you're, you just don't have that connection, build that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go out into nature, see his creation, have a conversation with him. Even if you're sitting on the prayer rug and not praying, have a conversation with Allah. Set a goal for yourself. Tomorrow, I'm going to pray Luhur. Then after that, I'm going to pray Luhur and Asr. After that, I will build it up to where I can pray three of my prayers, then four of my prayers, and then eventually five of your prayers. Start small. Build that connection. Um, be ex make it to where you're excited to have this conversation five times a day with your creator. You know, he, and he tells us, he tells us, you take one step towards me, I'll take 10 towards you. You walk towards me, I'll run to you. So he will meet you more than halfway. You just have to take that first step. You just have to want to. So set that daily goal. You know, if you're calling your best friend five times a day, you're not going to call your best friend time five times a day if you don't have that connection, right? What are you going to call and talk about? So build that connection with Allah. Know who it is you're talking to. Know who it is that, and, 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 and know that this is somebody that wants to hear from you. You're not a burden on, on, on this person that you're calling, that this, this creator that you're calling on, you're not a burden on him. He wants to hear you. And, and once you know that, and once you know that this is, you know, this is something that once it turns into something you'll want to do, you'll have no problem, but start small and don't be, don't be ashamed that you have a hard time. Again, just like our mental health fluctuates, our iman fluctuates. Our iman fluctuates and it's okay to struggle. We all struggle. We all have our, we all have our inner struggles. So just start small, have a conversation with him and then, and then move, move, um, move forward that way. This might have been on your, um, on your screen that you wanted to share, but someone asked, do you recommend any readings to increase mental health literacy in the masses? Um, mental health readings. One that really helped me whenever I was going through, um, therapy and that my therapist um, suggested was the alchemist. Um, that one really helped me put into perspective why, how, how everything in your life happens for a reason um, and how the struggles in your life actually come together to make you the, you know, to, to give you this great ending. Um, I can add that. I'll add a slide um, about some readings um, and I'll send that out to you, Imani. Um, to hopefully help whoever asked that question. Perfect. And if anyone here um, isn't on our mailing list, well, um, just feel free to drop your email into the chat box and we can get you added inshallah. Um, and so another question we want to ask, possibly our last one is many elders are now isolated and depressed because of their illnesses, et cetera, or inability to do certain things. What acts can the community to do to help them? I'm sorry, what was the last part? What acts can the community do to help them? Okay, um, at this point, I mean, with the pandemic, it's it's really hard. I would say spend time with them. I would say, you know, see them, check in on them. But it's it, especially for their for their health, it's it's really hard. Um, but to have a phone, just give them a phone call, want to talk to them, want to listen to the things that they want to say. And, and, you know, back in normal life, I would say, you know, building community centers for our, for our elderly, um, just community centers for them to spend the day at, for them to play games, for them to be able to talk for them. And, and they really like the, just that one-on-one -on -one time. They like to spend time with their families. They like to, you know, tell their stories. And so just to listen, just to talk. And I, I wish we could have these, you know, community centers and everything wasn't so banned and hard, especially for, um, especially for the older community, but just to check in on them, just to talk to them, just, they like to be around, um, they like to be around their loved ones. They like to be around people. And unfortunately, you know, the, it, depression and mental illness gets worse as you age. Um, and we don't know that, we don't see that. We typically don't see that. We, you know, we don't think about our elders um, and it's our duty to take care of them. So whatever we're able to do in this scope in during you know, our time with the pandemic right now, do it. If it's talking to them through a, a screen six feet apart, if it's, you know, whatever it is, just to make sure that they are taking, taken care of and are well. Um, that's a great idea. Um, I guess we have time for maybe another question. Um, so uh, another person asked, 
How do you approach depression or trauma with parents who don't want to talk about the past? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? It cut out for a little bit. How do you approach depression or trauma with parents who don't want to talk about the past? That's actually a very good question. Um, again, start slow. Just try and have small conversations. Um, you know, ask questions. If they don't want to talk about the past, it's it's for there's a reason. Um, there's a reason that they're hiding or not hiding. They're keeping it. They don't want to bring it back up. What is that reason? Um, and and it's hard in the older generations. Again, they were on survival mode. They didn't think about, you know, and, and their traumatic experiences are passed down to us. So we see, you know, their their traumatic experience. We we see family traits whenever we look at our family and the way th the way our families are. But in reality, it's it's the way trauma has 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 formed our families. It's not really family traits. It's due to our parents' trauma or the generational trauma. It's this is the way our family is now built up. So slowly having conversations, maybe bringing in Islamic perspectives. Um, if you can find Islamic, you know, talks for shiuch that they that they really or imams that they really respect um, on YouTube. Again, or masajid um, to talk about it and to talk about the importance of talking about things, of letting things go, of the importance of being able to discuss things that hurt us. Um, that may be one way to start, but um, just to start slow, don't don't come crashing in because it is, it is hard, again, for anybody to be vulnerable, to open up, especially if it's traumatic experiences. Um, we have five minutes for, uh, so we have another question. Um, someone asked, should I be more goal-oriented or value-oriented? Given my background, I found that trying to make goals for myself never works because there's an overwhelming lack of motivation. What are some tools and mechanisms I can use to keep myself motivated and more self-disciplined? Okay. I don't know what the, what the background is, but um, make sure that whatever it is that you're doing is something that you like doing. Um, there's nothing harder than to, to get yourself motivated to do something that you don't like, um, that you have no interest in. But, it, you know, if it's like something for school or... You, set daily goals, set small goals. Don't overwhelm yourself. Have a checklist. I've learned that having a checklist and the, the, the joy of crossing things off helped me, especially whenever I finished up my grad school um, courses in the beginning of the pandemic. I am not a person to stay home. I'm not a person to learn online. I like sitting in a classroom. I like having people around me to learn. And, and I struggled with motivation, but I found that writing things, write, writing my things that I have to do, seeing them and seeing how many they are and then having the joy of crossing things off um, really helped me. Don't overwhelm yourself. Get a task done, go for a walk. Um, tell yourself, have a reward system set up for yourself. If I finish this, I'll be able to, you know, uh, I can have an hour of Netflix. I can have an hour of reading time. I can have an hour with my friend. Set up a reward system for yourself. Set up checklists, set small goals. Everything, in four goals, everything is, is make sure it's in small amounts. You don't want to overwhelm yourself. And then once you overwhelm yourself, you won't get anything done. And the last question we have is what should we do when we get seasonal depression? For example, in winter, I feel more down and unmotivated than in other seasons. That's exactly, that's exactly me. The people will tell you once, if the sun's not out, neither is edema. Um, it's hard. Um, vitamin D vitamin D supplements, um, make sure you stay on your vitamins. They have um, light boxes, which I, I'm trying to find one with a good um, amount of light, like the, uh, a, good, a good light bulb, or sorry, light box to help um, give off the same ray of light as, sun, as sunshine. Um, those really help. So, so investing in that. Um, trying to get outside as much as as much as you can. I know it it's you know the it gets dark really early and it's really gloomy. But even being outside, being in nature with that fresh air, it does help. But but um, stock up on your vitamin D. Um, again, be grateful. Write out um, things that you're grateful for every morning and every night. Um, that helps. Be around people that um, that you like and that you that. Your, your support, your support people um, that you enjoy your time with. 
um, do things that you like because it, it is a tough time. Um, it is a tough time and, but, but it'll be over before you know it. But even if you can invest in that light box, um, that would be great, but we're in the same boat on that one. And Sister Dima for your time today. Um, I'm sure everyone here took away a lot. Um, and we'll be sending out an email with her resources, inshallah, um, from both the girls, Mistle Girls and Mistle Boys emails. Um, so again, we'll be here in uh, throw your email in the chat. If not, thank you so much, Sister Dima, for your time. Yeah. Thank you for helping and for, ha for having me. Thank you guys. Of course. Now I go. I go.